It's incredible to see what God is doing here in our church family, not only in student ministry, but uh, y'all, if you heard some of the stories of what God has done just in these last few weeks through this series on breakthrough, it, it, it's, it's as if God has rung the bell of freedom for so many of you for the very first time. Uh, and, and I've approached this series a little bit differently just because I feel like there are, uh, there are so many things that I need to personally walk through that I've felt like that this series has almost been uh, preached into a mirror, where even like in the last couple of weeks, I've had to walk through with my own therapist some of the, uh, some of the things that are holding my own heart, my own mind captive. And it's just been incredible to see the breakthroughs that, that so many of you have experienced. It's been so incredible to see uh, so many of you who have walked through difficult seasons, have navigated incredibly hard things and said, you know what, if God doesn't give me a breakthrough here, I know he's gonna do it on the other side because God's promise is always fulfilled. God's been doing some incredible things here in our church family. I hope you see it. I hope you're experiencing it. I hope you're, you're part of it. Uh, I don't want you to miss out on what God's doing. So in whatever way you can, wherever you're at in your faith journey, I, I, I encourage you, get connected in some way or another. Find a place to serve. Uh, jump into a small group. Uh, be a part of a ministry here at Mountain View or, or even in our community because God is doing amazing things. A few years ago, I had nose surgery, to which some of you were like, uh, it didn't work, you need a refund. <laughs> no, I had a, I had a septoplasty because I had blockage in one entire side. Apparently, 80 to 90% of my right side was completely blocked, which, oddly enough, like you need you need that to not be blocked so that you can breathe and, and, and all of that. And so I had to go in for a surgery, and uh, this surgery I went in on a Friday for, and it was supposed to take all of the weekend to recover. And so in my recovery, they took these stints the size of hot dogs and shoved them up my nose. And it was really cute until it wasn't because I got an infection and I spiked a fever and all of the pharmacies were closed and there was nothing to be done and it was completely miserable. And so I could not wait until that Monday to finally go in and get these crazy things pulled out of my nose. So Monday morning comes around and I go back to the doctor and show up and he sticks scissors up my nose and snips these stitches and out slides the first one. And aren't y'all glad you had breakfast this morning? And I could have finally breathed out of this one side, one down, one to go. He sticks the scissors up, snips again, and pulls. But it didn't come out. So he pulls harder and harder and harder and almost like gets some leverage and pulls against this stint in my nose, and then he grabs some forceps and starts to pull harder and twist harder and harder and harder until, allegedly, I grunted so loud that all of the nurses in the whole floor started coming in to the room, and they quickly laid me back and put a cold towel on my forehead and a lollipop in my mouth and <laughs> said, stay with us, stay with us, don't go to the light. Spoiler alert, like, I survived it and all of that, but I was in so much pain, and so the nurse uh, takes the light and shines it on my nose, and, and as she does, she says, oh, doctor, you, you forgot to snip out the stitches on that side. I was in so much pain, so miserable in that moment. I'd done everything right. I'd done all of the recovery right. I'd taken the steps that they had said, and yet this crazy stint was stuck in my nose because it was literally stitched into my nose. <laughs> there are things in our life, there are things in our, in our heart, 
things in our mind, things in our relationships that are literally woven and stitched into the very fabric of who we are. There are places in our life, even in the darkest, deepest corners that nobody else knows about that are so integrated into our life that we just feel like they're stuck where they're at. As we've been walking through this series of, uh, of breakthrough, there there've been moments where we're reminded, where we recall certain things, certain places of our life that just feel stuck. And one of those chains that seems to always constantly wrap itself around the axle of our life is the chain of bitterness. Bitterness seems to just kind of slide in and creep in on the sly. Uh, Bitterness seems to show up and something that happens, something that was said, something that goes unnoticed, and something that hurts incredibly deeply. And instead of dealing with the bitterness in our hearts and in our minds, instead of talking about it, instead of working through it, you just kind of hold on to it. But the problem with bitterness is when we just hold on to it, we don't address it, when we don't deal with it, it doesn't just stay something that hurts. It doesn't just stay something that's misunderstood. Bitterness, no, eventually and actually morphs into quite a mess in our own life. Bitterness, when we talk about bitterness, what, what, what I mean is bitterness is this idea of unforgiveness that has fermented. Uh, not in a nice, fine glass of wine, but fermented into something sour, into this hot garbage dumpster fire of a mess in our own life and in our own internal heart. Uh, there are times where bitterness is just this self-inflicted loathing where psychologically we're hoping to change our circumstances by directing anger toward the person who wronged us. Bitterness happens when we just continue to identify and and, and even internalize these frustrations and disappointments. Bitterness shows up in our life when we're bitter at someone else's success or we're bitter at our own lack of success, our own personal position in life. We see bitterness uh, show up in our life when we internalize and identify with what others have said about us. Not just in the middle school years of our life, but all throughout our life, what someone has said about us or to us. Bitterness comes from what others have done to us. And listen, abuse is a very real and very tragic thing that so many suffer in silence because of the abuse that they faced in their lives. And yet if they're not careful, these things can morph and and, and change and shift into Bitterness. Bitterness is what happens when we internalize and, and identify what others or, or what we have said about ourselves. So we get bitter. We get angry. We get mad. We hold a grudge. We harbor resentment. Something that happened was something that we didn't deserve. The chain of bitterness is real. Uh, The chain of bitterness is present in all of our lives. It doesn't have to be uh, anything huge. It can be something small and minor that then eventually grows and develops in these dark corners of our life. But it is not, hear me loud and clear, it is not something that has to be present in our life. It's not something that we just have to carry all throughout our life. And one of the things that I love about Scripture is that Scripture doesn't hide the difficulties of life. Uh, Scripture doesn't just paint this picturesque uh, photo of how everything is a perfect bliss. No, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. No, Scripture is full of stories of humans. And when humans are involved, there's going to be friction. There's gonna be tensions. There's gonna be hurt feelings. There's gonna be a mess. Uh, Just look at the story of Joseph. Joseph. The story of Joseph goes that he was thrown into a pit by his brothers. He was left and abandoned and left for dead. Then he was picked up and thrown into slavery and carted off to a foreign land. This is someone who should have been bitter, but yet he saw God working through it. 
the story of Job. In the book of Job, maybe a book of what you thought was job, and you think, I don't want any career like this because Job's life, his entire existence was miserable because Job lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. He lost everything around him. Then think of the story of Hannah. Hannah lost the one dream that she had in life. She had dreamed of becoming a mother. Hannah wanted desperately but never could have that child. Scripture says she's, she was found weeping bitterly. Think of the story of Naomi. Naomi is the very definition of bitterness. Uh, Naomi was married with two boys, and her husband and both of her boys eventually passed away long before their time. She was angry. She was upset. She was disappointed. So she travels back to her hometown of Bethlehem, and when she gets back, everyone's excited to see Naomi. Naomi, oh, is that you? How are you doing, Naomi? What's going on? Everybody knew. Everybody knew the despair and the, 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 the loss that had come at the hands of death for her. Naomi, is that you? She said, no, 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 don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara which means bitter. I want everybody to know everything that's happened and gone wrong in my life to the extent that I'm willing to change my name for it. Don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me bitter. There's no doubt that even in the room today, I can imagine there are plenty of us who are carrying heavy circumstances. Yes, something is wrong. Yes, Something has been done wrong to you, but you've internalized it to the, to the point that it's become a chain, and today, I'm telling you, I, I want to declare for us that today you can be set free, that you don't have to carry this anymore, that, that God doesn't want us to be held back by the bitterness that, that has such a tight grip on our life from the hurts and the frustrations and the pain and the anger from the past. Today, Jesus invites us to walk in the victory that he has for us. Whether it's small hurts or big hurts, whether it's small habits and hang-ups, or whether it's something massive. So how in the world is it possible to experience freedom, to experience a breakthrough when it comes to bitterness in our life. I want us to look at a familiar story, a story that you may have heard before, a story that you may have even read before or told before, but it's a story in Luke chapter 15 called the story of the prodigal son. It's a story of a lost son, a story of a forgiving father, uh, the, the reckless, crazy love of this father, and a story of an older brother. Jesus tells this story As all of the religious leaders have gathered around, Jesus tells this story not only to the religious leaders who are around, but he shares the story to even the tax collectors and the Pharisees, these people who had no business being in in the presence of a religious leader. Jesus tells this story of a prodigal son. And the story goes that the younger brother left town and decided he wanted to demand his inheritance before his dad even died. In Jewish culture, this is essentially approaching your father and saying, hey, I wish you were dead. So go ahead and give me everything that's mine as if you were dead. And so this younger son left for greener pastures, thinking and hoping that he would find fulfillment. But instead of fulfillment, this boy ended up hitting rock bottom. And he ran out of money, and he found out so quickly that the promises that the world makes never bring fulfillment. The the world can only give us empty pinatas when it comes to the satisfaction in our life. And so he runs out of money, he runs out of friends, he runs out of luck, he runs out of everything that he needs to survive and decides he's gotta go back home. He's gotta tuck his tail and hope maybe my father will bring me back in. Maybe I can just be a servant on his ranch. And so he heads home. 
He's embarrassed his father. He's embarrassed his family. He's brought shame in his community. They probably won't have me back, he thought, but maybe I can just be a servant. Maybe I can just take care of the animals. Maybe I can just prepare meals. But when he gets home, he finds his father recklessly loving and pursuing and chasing him back home to the extent where the dad throws a party. My son who was dead is now alive. My son who was lost is now found. That's a picture of the gospel. And that's the picture that we pick up in the story. In verse 25, now his older son, this dad, now his older son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said to the older brother, your brother has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Wait, you're telling me that that scum came back home? He... He, he's darkened the door of our home again. He had the audacity to come back after everything that he did. Wait, wait, wait. That noise that I'm, you're telling me that's a, that's a party that my dad has thrown for him? If we're being honest, every single one of us would jump on the bandwagon with the older brother. Yeah, he's right. What's he doing? He shamed the family. We would all jump on the bandwagon with the the frustration and the anger and the bitterness coming from this brother. But I don't want us to do that this morning. Instead, I want us to realize that we're not just jumping on the bandwagon with, with this older brother. We are the older brother in the story. And if you and I want to walk in the freedom that God has for us, we have got to realize and understand that we're the older brother. That there is a chain that has been holding us back, just like this older brother. And and, and I don't know what happened to you. God does. I know in my own life, there are moments, there are seasons of bitterness where I just hang on to a resentment that happened months ago. There are things that I, I hold on to that, yes, are at times small and petty, but There are also things that are really significant and painful. This older brother had every reason. He was completely justified to be mad. And there are some of you, there are people in this room who have reason to be mad. You have reason to feel hurt. You have reason to grieve because some really hard things have happened to you. And my message, please hear me loud and clear, I am not saying to you this morning, just get over it. I'm not even gonna leverage this whole Jesus juke of let go and let God. Because that's not what God says to us. God doesn't even show up in these moments of bitterness to say, hey, would you just get over it? No, I'm telling you, God has a freedom, chain-breaking choice for you and I to make today, and the choice is this. You and I have a choice in all of the anger and frustration and resentment. We have a choice to either be bitter or to get better. Every single day, this older brother watched his father, who was taken advantage of by his younger brother. He watched his father probably standing on the front porch, looking off in the distance, praying and hoping maybe today's the day that my youngest son will come home. Maybe today I'll just hear word that he's okay. Maybe today something will trigger in his mind that reminds him that he is so loved. Every day this older brother watched grace and love and mercy of his father. And every day he grew more and more bitter. This chains of bitterness grew in his life to the point that he gets Word that his younger brother is coming home and he's made it home and that they've thrown a party for him and he's bitter about it. For some of us, the bitterness in our life, we just think it's no big deal. When, when we think about the bitterness of our life, we think it's a, it's a chain like this. You know what, it's, it's no big deal. 
what they did to me, what, how they hurt me, I'm justified. It, it, it doesn't have a wrap around my life. It, it's no big deal. What, what they said to me hurt. Brandon, you don't understand. What happened to me, I'm justified in, in having this chain in my life. Uh, you don't understand what I went through. This is my, this is my coping mechanism. This is the way that I'm gonna punish them for whatever they did to me. It's the only way I can get through. You just don't understand what I went through. And you're right, I don't, but God does. I don't understand, but I, but I do know that at times when the chain of bitterness shows up in our life, it shows up like this, but then eventually and actually and over time, becomes this chain that holds us back from what God has for us. Can I just tell you that at some point, the longer you identify with this chain of bitterness, the longer you uh, internalize this chain of bitterness, the bigger it's gonna be, the heavier it's gonna become, the more it's gonna grip itself to your heart. And I just want you to know this morning that what happened to you in the past, that person, for some of you, they're not even thinking about you anymore. It's long gone. They're not even around. They're doing their own thing. And that thing that they did to you is now stuck in your life. So we've got to begin to see that, that we're the older brother. That this chain that we excuse away has actually got a hold of us in a significant way. Now, my job is, is really easy today because I don't, even have to, I don't even have to tell you what you're frustrated about. Like, I don't even have to give specifics because as soon as I talk about bitterness, you know exactly what bitterness looks like in your life. But it's helpful if you'll identify it, not excuse it. Joanna Weber says it like this. She says, bitterness is like, drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Our natural response is to hold on, thinking we're just gonna punish them for whatever they did to us. But when we hold on, when we allow bitterness to take root, it may feel easier, but it is way more costly. And it's gonna hurt us and hold us back, and it's what the enemy is using to rob you, not only of what happened in the past, but the enemy uses it to rob you of your future, the future that God has for you. One option that we have when we face tragedy and hurt is bitterness. The other is to be better. I'm not talking about like self-help speech. I'm not talking like TED talk, let's get better. No, I'm talking about being better, not as a verb. I'm, being, I'm talking about better as a noun because better is a person, not a principle. So are you willing to ask God to help you in this chain of bitterness in your life? Here's what it requires. Freedom from bitterness requires listening. Back to the story, verse 28. The older brother was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came home, who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Can't you just hear in this moment the bitterness building and building and building? Look, Dad, you, you owe me. I deserved that party that you're throwing for my brother. I deserve to be celebrated. I've done the right thing, yet he blew all your money. He's the one who shamed our family and embarrassed you. Let me just pause here to say that, yeah, some of the things that you're dealing with, you need to have a serious dialogue with God. Scripture says that we can cast all of our burdens on him. Why? Because he cares for us. God doesn't say to us, hey, just trust me, have a little faith. It's just easy. No, he doesn't require that we say, I'm okay with everything that happens in life. No, there are things in life that happen 
that are just wrong, that are just bad. But God's not afraid of your frustrations and your anger. You don't have to fake it in front of God, but also don't forget to listen to God. Don't forget to hear from God in his word. Don't listen to the wrong voices. Uh, For some of us, we're, we're just listening to our own internal voice, which gives us bad advice. There are some of us who are listening to the bad advice of coworkers. There are some of us who are listening to the bad advice of family, of people who don't follow Jesus, telling us how we ought to live our life when Jesus invites us to live it like him. This is what the dad says in verse 31. And he said to his older son, son, you are always with me. All that's mine is yours. My son, my daughter, you've always been with me. The grace I gave him is the grace that is here for you. If you want to experience freedom from bitterness, if you want to experience a breakthrough in in the bitterness that is trapped so deep in your heart, then freedom comes when we stop dwelling on what's happened and what's been done to us. And we start dwelling on what's been done for us. God's given us grace that we didn't deserve. We get so busy building this case and piling up all of this evidence against someone else and that we, in that moment, forget the pile of grace that God's poured out onto our life. So what does it mean? How, how can we unlock and experience a breakthrough? It starts with forgiveness. It starts with forgiveness. What is forgiveness? It's this word that's tossed around in churches and Christian circles. Forgiveness, very simply, is my release and God's removal. It's me saying to this person, hey, you don't owe me anything anymore. I'm releasing that and trusting God with that. And what God does when we forgive is God actually removes. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 4 as he's writing to this young church, talking about the dynamics of relationship and life together, this is what Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Man, don't we need this in an election year. Anyway, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Y'all, we gotta reverse engineer this verse. Start from the back and then move forward. Let's see, reverse engineer it. You know what I'm talking about. Start at the back. God has forgiven us. As you continue to work through, God has forgiven us and so because we are forgiven, we ought to forgive. And as we forgive, that means we're not just forgiving, but we're being kind to people. We're getting rid of all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice. Paul wasn't the only one who talked about forgiveness. Jesus himself talked about forgiveness. Jesus said, pray that God would forgive you just as you have forgiven those who've wounded you. Paul said it again in a, in a different letter. He says, love your enemies, serve the people who have hurt you and wronged you. And when you do, when you serve those who have hurt you, Paul says what you're doing is you're actually like throwing burning coals on their head. To which we're like, uh, we wanna do that without the forgiveness. Peter asked Jesus in conversation, Jesus, what's the limit here? How many times should we forgive? Is it seven times? And Jesus says, no, no, no. It's 77, or 70 times seven. Jesus wasn't putting out a mathematical equation here because he knows I can't do math. He's just saying forgiveness has no limit. Yes, you've been wronged. Yes, you've been hurt. Yes, they've done it all over again. No, Jesus isn't telling you you shouldn't put up boundaries in your life or you should let 
people walk all over you. No, that's not what Jesus is saying at all. But he's been saying you've been given the key to freedom and that key is called forgiveness. It's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna happen from our own strength and power. It happens when we set our mind on the fact that we have been forgiven. There was no limit that God placed on my life when he was forgiving me. You know, I believe one of the most God-honoring things that can happen today. Uh, I believe that, that some who are here today will begin to penetrate through the, br- the bitterness toward a breakthrough. If you just take a simple step and have a conversation with somebody right after this gathering. Some of you right now may need to pull out your phone and say, hey, can I call you in about 10 minutes? So that you can have a conversation, you can have a cup of coffee, you can have that conversation that you've dreaded just to say, hey, you hurt me. You may not even think that you did anything wrong. You may not even know that I've been hurt, but I want you to know that I'm hurt and I'm disappointed and it's been painful, but I want you to know that I'm forgiving you or or I'm asking God to help me to forgive you. Call someone, set up a coffee with someone, apologize to someone. It's not the time to settle the account. Hey, you did this and this is why you were wrong. No, it's not that time at all. But followers of Jesus are not known by hate and grudges and bitterness. We are known by our desire to forgive and reconcile. Relationship may never go back to the way that it was. The enemy would love nothing more than for us to stay bitter like the older brother. Standing outside, standing off at a distance, judging. They didn't deserve that. They didn't deserve a welcome home. They didn't deserve a party. My question for you is, what are you missing out on because of your bitterness? What are you missing out on because of your anger, your your pride, your grudge? I'm telling you, you're missing out on the freedom that God has for you. If you fast forward from the story of Naomi, the story of bitterness, to the story of Jesus, we find in Matthew chapter one, the genealogy of Jesus, the lineage, the family tree, the people who led up to the eventual birth of the Messiah himself. In Matthew chapter one, Matthew says it like this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar and Perez the father of Hezron. Fast forward just a little bit, verse five, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, father of Obed by Ruth. Ruth, who we're gonna be studying the book of Ruth in the month of February together. Ruth was the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Naomi, who lost everything who was known to be mad and hurt, who took it to the extent and said, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. But yet here she is in the story of Jesus. She hung on. She trusted in God. She clung to God. If you don't believe that God can take what's bad and turn it for good, just look at the story of Naomi. You think the enemy's robbed from you and maybe he has but God can turn it for good. And you too can see his goodness in the land of the living. Naomi through Ruth is in the genealogy of Jesus. How's God gonna use your pain, your hurt, your bitterness? First, he wants to see you break through from it and experience freedom so that he can use you and your future to bring hope and redemption and reconciliation, to bring freedom to the people that you interact with, to walk forward, not looking backwards. And it's time for us, church, to walk free and walk fearless in the freedom plan that God has for us. Would you pray? Lord, no doubt, in a moment like this, with people like us. For some, for many, we're just carrying bitterness. 
God, I thank you that you've shown us this morning that we don't have to carry that. We don't have to hang on to that. So Lord, today, right now, would you work in ways that we cannot explain? Would you work in ways to cut down out from the roots the bitterness that has made its home in our hearts? God, would you set us free? Would you change us as our chain breaker? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.